Before I tell you my part in all of this, I need to go back to where it began. My ancestor, Aizo Nakamura, was, by all accounts, an asshole. But an opportunistic one. Seize the day, the night, and all the bodies that bask under it with their jewelry unprotected. He declared in his journal, that fateful night one late summer's evening, in 1866, bragging about how he'd scored another heist with his brother, Minato Nakamura, that they'd survive the famine and buy all the hookers they could ever want, with the leftover sums. Most folk aren't buried in Japan. In fact, 99.8% of them are cremated. So, Aizo wasn't robbing graves. He was robbing corpses before they were cremated. Aizo was resourceful, careful, and precise. He would pick the bodies of those who he knew had very few relatives. Minato would pay off the mortician, and they'd ransack the corpse before anyone came to pay their respects. He'd make the excuse that it was to stave off starvation during the Tenpo Famine of 1833, starting when he was just a boy in Honshu, and lasting until he was in his teens. But he continued to steal long after that. Which brings us to why we're here today. His greed would ultimately bring ruin upon every male member of the Nakamura bloodline. In the last winter solstice he spent in Japan, now in his late thirties and with a young family, Aizo and Minito resolved to rob the home of a Shinto priest in the region, knowing his young son was riddled with consumption and soon to pass. With distraction plaguing the father's mind, Aizo knew it would be a simple task to rob him blind. The job is easy. We waited in the trees on the night they come. The job is easy. We wait in the trees on the night they come to give the young master his rights, and upon their departure, sneak in and claim what we know he won't miss. He was giddy with excitement. Lord knows his arrogance given he documented these raids. Sure enough, as documented, the pair lie in wait and watched as the priest's contemporaries filled in one by one and read the poor boy his last rites. The grief-stricken father, seeing them out with despair written across his face, clearly too distraught to do them himself. As he thanked them outside, Aizo and Minato snuck around the back and entered the home. When they found the sickly boy, laying in his bed and barely breathing. It seems that Minato felt a pang of guilt and wanted to hold off. These are the hours of the ox. It's unwise to do this now. Besides, he cast his eyes to the boy, Aizo noting the regret in his eyes. He's still alive. He could make a scene. Before casting his gaze forward to the priest's safe room, the door slightly ajar and promises of priceless artifacts, donations, and food, laying just out of reach. I wasn't about to let some child not long for this world get in the way of our job. Besides, the sick should give way for the strong, and where his boy is dying, mine was most certainly living. So I did what I had to. What that turned out, it seemed, was suffocating the life out of the child. Aizo reported he thrashed ever so slightly before falling limp, an errant hand the only thing still clasping tightly to Aizo's forearm in the moments following, as if clutching to the last vestige of life he'd ever come to know. To his credit, Minato punched his brother in disgust, questioning if he was even sane to do such a horrific thing, let alone in the hollowed hours between one and three when the worst could befall them. 
But the commotion had roused the priest, and within moments, he was stood in the doorway, eyes aghast, and trembling hands reached out towards the brothers. It was at that moment that Izo, Minato, and the rest of our lives would be inexorably changed forever. I couldn't tell you exactly what the priest said to him, how his grief-rattled voice shook the very foundations of his home as if a typhoon were striking the bows with unshackled prejudice, or if Izo and Minato ever saw justice for their crime. But I can tell you that whatever specifics were discussed drove Izo to gather his family and leave for the mountains in 1870, issuing contact with the outside world and becoming fiercely protective of his boy. At night, he would sit by his front door and with sword in hand, wait with trembling lips and shaking hands. He wrote in his journal, they always come in the hour of the ox. They crawl up the foundations of the home and whisper in my ear, sometimes asking me to do terrible things, other times promising me it'll all end if I open the door. I saw one of them once, a horned, pale-skinned ogre with fangs the size of my forearm yellow eyes with the blackest pupils that widened to an ungodly pit when they fixated on me. The voice constantly stuck between hysterical laughter and the most pained sobs, no different to an animal trying to produce human mimicry. It cooed for me to step outside and face what I'd done. But I am a coward and I will not abandon my family. Aizo wasn't the only one suffering from these night visits. Minato began thrashing in his sleep every night as his wife struggled to console him. He would flail madly as if fighting off unseen hands, deep lacerations forming on his skin and thick, large bite marks puncturing his soft flesh. Whenever he awoke, sweating and as if he'd aged some years each night. He would refuse to comment on what happened, save for one phrase. We should have never gone during the hours of the ox. We deserve what we get. It was on his deathbed a mere four years later, only 42, but stricken with white frail hair and atrophied muscles that he looked at the spot in the corner, and his eyes grew wide, biting his lip to the point of drawing blood. She's ready for her last meal, it seems. I'm sorry I couldn't stop it. With that, he exhaled deeply, his back arching to the point of snapping before he froze. Dead. Izo lasted a decent while longer, refusing to come to Minato's funeral and effectively shutting out the outside world, save for his family on their small rice farm. He watched his three children grow older and, on his eldest son's 29th birthday, told him the truth behind his episodes. The reason I am here with you all today. That night, in that home, during the hours of the ox, the Shinto priest performed what is known as Ushi no Takimari, a curse placed upon the brothers for their heinous crimes, destined to suffer in both this and the next life. Aizo wept and the guilt of his actions overcame him as he apologized profusely to his son Tenzin 
the young man not understanding why. In those later hours when the knocking on the door grew frantic and the scratching accompanied a deafening wailing that Tenzin whipped around to hear, his father, gasping from his bed. So he was right. You hear it too. Tenzin, look under the tatami plates near our porch. And please, forgive me. He died soon after leaving Tenzin with the uncomfortable knowledge that every man in my family now carries on their shoulders. We are all cursed. Every single one of us. Every man in my family begins to see these creatures on their 29th birthday, and misfortune befalls them throughout the rest of their days. Sometimes they go weeks without an incident. Sometimes hours. It seems to vary from member to member. But as the generations grew, all the men reported seeing them around the time they reached 29. When trying to find the priest who originally placed this curse in order to apologize, they were unable to locate him or anyone who knew him. The search was ultimately fruitless, and each member of the Nakamura clan dealt with the curse in their own way. Tenzin tried to maintain the property in his father's absence. His younger brother committed suicide on the night of his 30th birthday, manic and wild-eyed as he struck a blade through his belly, right in front of his children. Now they won't use me as a hive, he gurgled, blood seeping through his teeth and staining them a dark coffee red as he fell forward. His son would later report hearing an incessant buzzing in his ear, itchiness on his skin and bumps appearing over his body that he couldn't get rid of. He'd eventually throw himself into the river at the age of 34 as a cleansing ritual that he unsurprisingly didn't survive. My grandfather Hiroshi took his wife and my dad across the ocean and here to the UK during the Second World War, declaring a desire to escape the atrocities of the Empire, ply his trade out west and help the British government as a translator. Though my grandmother would recount that he secretly hoped the sightings would stop if they were blessed by another priest and started over in a new land where these yokai could not follow. He was wrong. Within a decade, Hiroshi would be driven to the point of insomnia, refusing to sleep for fear the spindly thing in the gutters would rise out of the drain to claim him. He began scarcely washing, only opting to do so when he could take the bucket into the living room so as to not see into the drain. His son, my dad Jushin, was obviously concerned seeing his father slowly devolving into nothing more than a husk that babbled on about rattling of the pipes. The incessant singing that only he could hear emanating from the neighbors above, despite living on the top floor, and other maladies that ultimately drove Hiroshi to a heart attack when I was just a boy. I remember the drive home from the funeral. A Shinto burial in London is a rare sight, and though my dad and I were more British than we were Japanese, we still upheld tradition. My frail Nana looking at me from her wheelchair and shaking her head as she pointed to me and spoke to my mother. I remember my father's white knuckles as he gripped the steering wheel for dear life and screamed in broken Japanese for something to get out of the way, despite the roads being clear. I remember the car toppling over the embankment and the feeling of inertia washing over me 
as my small body was thrown around like a rag doll. My dad's promises to fix the passenger seat belt now coming back to haunt him. I remember the quiet aftermath. Soft, pained breaths in the husk of that car as I looked ahead and saw my father's mangled body crawling back to the dashboard. Only half of him making the return trip. Theodore, ignore the whispers, he repeated, intersplicing a small chant until his breathing grew shallow and the blue lights blinded him from my vision. He was 31. To the best of my knowledge, he never once displayed the kind of anxiety or distress previous members had shown. I'd even seen my uncle and grandfather in more withered states around that time. But my dad, to me at least, seemed immune to it all. Proud of his work and a diligent parent, he always strived to be the best he could. But maybe it was that desire to ignore the fate bestowed upon him that caused his end. So here we are. Some two decades later, and now my turn. My brother, Harry, went missing for a few years back. Though my mother is convinced it was his wonderlust, and that he's probably somewhere in South America stoned out of his mind. But he never took narcotics for fun. Always to quell his paranoia of something following him. Harry routinely believed that the stars followed him wherever he went, particularly one that's situated in the east. A sickly magenta and humming, always humming, as he described it. Following him wherever he went, rising and growing as he tried to outrun it. I asked him why it terrified him so much when it was so far away. But when his eyes met mine, I understood that there was something else in the sky. Something he wouldn't dare to describe that was after him. If you saw the glow, heard the hum, felt the presence, you'd know, Theo. He'd take a deep drag of his cigarette and wave me off, not wanting to discuss it anymore. On the weekend of his 29th, he bade us farewell and set us off backpacking, telling Mom he needed to find himself, while telling me he hoped the stars wouldn't follow him there. Odd as that statement sounded. In my case... I guess I'd prepared for it my whole life. Indulging in horror has been my forte to such a degree that, hell, I made it a full-time job, weaving experiences from my life or the lives of those I knew, and making them into something to terrify others, knowing full well that nothing would ever match what was waiting for me. It started last year on my 28th, I woke up the following morning with a start, the whispering in my ear faint, but unmistakably alien. You shouldn't take your medication today. I looked around, puzzled and trying to figure out if it was my sleep-addled state, a leftover portion of the dream I was having. Spotting nobody and not hearing any follow-up responses, I roused myself out of bed and got on with my day, cursing myself for forgetting my medication and the feeling of something watching me permeating throughout my day. So from there, it grew like a cancer. 
Over the weeks, I would feel something placing icy hands around my neck or my stomach, jolting me and causing me to drop something valuable, stumble over the street and once even careen my car into the back of my mom's. With every momentary fright and creeping sense of dread, I could feel this thing grow in confidence and power. I spent the remaining part of 2019 researching our family lineage as best I could, trying desperately to find a way to alleviate the curse, to atone for my ancestors' sins or stave it off. But after numerous overseas calls to our native relatives in Japan and lengthy chats with my Nana, it was to no avail. You can run from it, plead with it, bargain with it, but the curse shall not relent, my Nana rasped, the sadness gripping her old but kind face. I lost my husband and my son to that wretched curse. I couldn't bear to lose you too. I remember taking her hand and smiling, looking up at her to thank her for her kindness, but not seeing the face of my Nana where her head rested. Instead, the most grotesque shape stretched itself over my Nana's skull. Hollowed out eye sockets with amorphous shapes undulating in the black pits. Layers of rotting flesh stretching over gangrenous muscle tissue and blackened bone. Melding with the mold and the fungal rot amassing around the head. It cocked its head at me as it grinned. You will never see her face again. This is the crushing nature of the Curie. I backed away, softly apologizing to my Nana in a cold sweat, my chest tightening and vision growing blurry. I was having a panic attack. Managing to get to my car, I tried desperately to calm myself down, punching the steering wheel in frustration as my mind shot back to those final moments my dad suffered through. Did he see then what I see now? So it went. The Curie kept its promise. First just with my Nana until she died in the spring, then moving on to my cousins, aunts, uncles, and in July, my mother. I've tried as many excuses as I can muster in order to put off seeing her. But I think with my age rapidly approaching 30, she senses something is off. I finally told my partner about it in the week leading up to my birthday. She tried her best to understand, but when she put her hand on mine and suggested I speak to a therapist, I knew it would always be a barrier she's unable to cross. I couldn't blame her. To the outside world, it must seem as if our family simply has a history of severe mental illness on the male side. Maybe we do. Maybe it's just latent in our minds until we finish maturity in our mid-twenties. And the 29th birthday is simply self-fulfilling prophecy. We expect it to happen and so it does. Last week, a few days shy of my birthday, the Curie came to me in a dream. Draped in a cloak of muscles and guts, it peered from the tip of the cloak to laugh at me. You want to be set free, yes. 
It cooed. My desperation practically palpable at this point. A solid year without proper sleep, communication with my family, or a reason to live. I nodded, tears forming in my eyes at the prospect of freedom. Then go to where your father lost his life. I will return once I came and find a new victim. I will lead you there. I didn't tell my partner. I didn't tell anyone. I left a simple note and an excuse why I had to go. Deactivated my social media and set off for where he had his accident. Winchester. To those of you not local, it's a countryside situated a hundred miles from London sprawling hills and surrounded by nature. It was our nation's capital for centuries. It also has many quiet countryside roads with vast open fields. The kind my father lost his life on. As I drove down the dimly lit roads, my sole companion was the Curie, whispering in my ear, just a little bit further. You'll be there soon. I'll find someone new, and I swear I'll let you go. You never even bore a son. It's no fun when you don't react anymore. Exhaustion, misery, and hunger gripped my soul as I sped up desperate to get this thing gone. My mind racked with thoughts of how my predecessors had succumbed to the other members of this creature's family. How many more would fall? I had cousins. There was still a chance it'd continue. I saw the long, winding road known as Hatches Lane the lights nearly flickering as my car pulled up near the embankment. Was it here? Maybe it was further. My eyes were feeling heavy and I struggled to focus. Get out and walk. I'll take you there. I want to be rid of you. It whispered. The voice almost sorrowful now as I willed my aching frame to move and trudge through the darkness. How long had it been since I'd eaten? Drank. My mouth felt so dry that swallowing brought the sensation of razors slinking down my throat. My eyes felt itchy and my head was pounding. I could barely see the cold whipping through my bones. A little further. Keep going. We're almost there. My knees gave out and I felt the darkness take me. The only thing left was the sight of that fucking creature as it grinned. Images of my father, grandfather, and the other countless men in my family stood silently behind it. Heads bowed and shackled with their own abominations to their side tormenting them. I cannot wait to drag you down to hell with me, to join the rest of the Nakamura clan. It bared its teeth, a yellow tongue oozing pus and lapping around its face in a snake-like manner as it cackled. Before I could respond, a blinding light shone through the darkness, and I was brought to my senses with worried faces looming over me. My partner, and a pair of paramedics. I should be thankful I had the Find My iPhone function on my phone, 
and that the note was ominous enough for my partner to look further into. Any later, and I doubt they'd have found me. Both she and the doctor chalked it up to a psychotic break, pertaining to the family's superstition of the men turning 29. I didn't argue, nor did I protest going to therapy and spending time focusing on getting better. To their credit, I didn't see or hear the Curie. After some time, I began to think that perhaps things could return to normal. That I'd be able to find some sense of normality amid a sea of misfortune and tragedy. But, last Monday, the day after I turned 29, right as the clock turned to 1 a.m., through to 3 a.m., and entered the hours of the ox, I saw two things standing at the foot of my bed, my partner sleeping soundly through them all. The first was my father, propping himself up on his elbows. The bottom half of him stood at the side patiently. A look of sorrow across his still and youthful face as he turned to glance at the other figure. The Curie. Teeth bared. Pale skin cloaked in muscles. And eyes that sickly tinted yellow that Izo had seen so long ago. You can run from it, plead with it, bargain with it, but the curse shall not relent. He breathed as the Curie cackled, making me fully aware of what the rest of my life would look like. My new, horrible reality. Happy birthday, son. Good luck. Greetings, friends and fiends. It is I, Chronicler. We here at Creepy Spaghetti would like to thank T.J. Lee for allowing us to tell their story. If you enjoyed this story, be sure to subscribe to stay updated on these terrible tales. And make sure to check out the author in the links below. If you're interested in having your story narrated, be sure to reach out to our humble overseer as he continues his journey to pull the darkest stories from the infinite depths of the internet. Until next time, fiends. And remember, we are darkness.